kid I know, I'm ugly. I stuck my head out the window, got arrested for mooning. <laughs> I know I'm ugly. I went to a freak show to let me in for nothing. <laughs> kid, I was an ugly kid, too. How ugly? How ugly? <laughs> I was so ugly, my mother breastfed me through a straw. <laughs> The comedian we're talking about today might be the only stand-up comedian in the history of America to have a board game. Which, of course, I immediately bought off of eBay the second I knew it existed. Let's see. Kudos to this packing job. Two boxes in one? Wild. One minute. Wow. It's, wow. It's a little color faded, but we're not going to judge it. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> Wow. Do you want to earn respect finally in your life? A nerve-wracking, number-stacking game of sudden death. Wow. What a dream. It's, it's a race to the top, you guys. Um, this guy is going to get some respect, I think, finally. Wow. Hold on. Let's see. Oh, they taped it for me. So nice. Oh, my gosh. Oh, it has jokes in it. Oh, my gosh. There's little jokes in the... <laughs> Has this ever been opened before? I'm not sure. There he is. Wow. This Is this just Parcheesi with Rodney Dangerfield's face on it? Very well could be. Oh, it's definitely never been used because the numbers aren't even punched out. Well, exciting. Uh, can't wait to make my boyfriend play this game with me. Wow. <laughs> Hi, Rod. You're looking wonderful, Rod. Eric, thank you very much, Johnny. You look kind of cute yourself, you know that? <laughs> Last episode was a bit of a downer. Um, so thank you so so many nice things about it, that little rainy day, sad rainy day video. But damn it if Rodney isn't the perfect follow-up because his story's all about second chances. It's all about returning to comedy. He famously took like a 10 to 12 year break in the middle of his career, so everything's okay. <laughs> We're going to find our way home. Also, before we really dive in, I have a Patreon now, which is very exciting. You can get lots of bonus content. I put in behind the scenes videos where I make updates or maybe deleted scenes, that sort of thing. Um, talk about my ideas and, and share what else is going on in the comedy sphere. If you have some extra dollars and you like the work that I do, it really helps me um, make these videos and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for everyone who does and uh, let's dive. Let's get into it. Okay. My wife isn't too smart, you know. One night you went out, some guy stole the car. I said to her, just see what he looked like. She told me she got the license plate number. <laughs> so, Roddy Dangerfield. What even comes to mind, right? He's such a cartoon. He's such a like ridiculous human being. <laughs> He merchandised the hell out of himself. He knows exactly who he is. He's definitely in the like Groucho Marx, Bugs Bunny tradition of stand-up. And truly, I think he's the comedian. He's a machine. I don't know any comedian that could even come close to competing with Rodney Dangerfield um, in terms of like laughs per minute. He's such a killer. He's got such perfect word economy. Like the no respect thing is such a brilliant comic persona everything is punching up because he's so so down uh, but there is this sort of like well of sadness that does sort of live just beneath the surface with him it's not it's not terribly well hidden you know, the roar of the crowd is over you're alone then after the show you look for someone to hang out with you know what i mean i'm still alone I can't find no one to hang out with. <laughs> and look, other comedians might have pushed the form more. Other comedians might have invented new styles and brought about new trends and done more inventive, beautiful things. Um, but damn, Rodney. No one can compete with him in laughs per minute. He's the best. He's a machine. And yet he did it all very strangely. He broke really, really late. He was an older comedian when he broke. And he's sort of like outside of space and time. <laughs> he's, he became super popular. He peaked in the early 80s with a style that was super popular in the like 40s. He's this really strange anomaly, but he's eminently lovable and just so damn good. Literally the same year that No Respect came out, 1980, the same year his like magnum opus, is the same exact year that Richard Breyer lit himself on fire freebasing cocaine. The same 
year. It makes no sense. And here's Ronnie Dangerfield pretending it's like 1948 doing Jewish cat skills humor. And yet, and yet, it's so freaking perfect, man. And you know what? He got to be that good because like so many other comedians, he sucked for a long time. He like was really bad. <laughs> but unlike other comedians, he sucked for a long time, quit, stepped away, you know, did the husband father thing for, I don't know, 12, 12 years, I think. And then tried again, started over, returned to it. Within a few years, he was doing it full time. And then bada bing, bada boom, one of the best comedians in American history. Second chances, you guys. It's never too late. Go out and live your dreams. <laughs> uh, well, don't go out. Stay in and live your dreams in COVID. Let's button one more button here. Come on, we're classy. This is a classy show. Now let's talk about Rodney. And like, actually speaking, we're not going to talk about Rodney because there is no Rodney Dangerfield. We're going to talk about Jacob Cohen, who was born in 1921 in Babylon, New York. Today they got two very ugly kids. Ugly kids, yes. <laughs> In fact, they're all so ugly in a family album. They only keep the negatives. So he grew up with a single mother and they lived sort of all over New York. His father was actually a vaudevillian. His father was a comedy performer. Wouldn't you know it? And he had a pretty rough childhood. His mother, by all accounts, was a pretty unpleasant woman. And his father wasn't around. They were really underprivileged. Um, and it was a rough go. It definitely seems like he has some childhood trauma, some emotional abuse. Um, there's so many things about comedy coming from tragedy, and he's a prime example of someone who had a really rough personal life just sort of from the jump. And from a young age, he loved comedy. I guess it was something that he found to bring him some joy. He loved W.C. Fields and Laurel and Hardy and Groucho. Of course he loved Groucho. Like, he he is the next incarnation of, of the Groucho vibe. Actually, I live in Queens now. So here's a story. I took a little road trip out because I heard that there was a plaque for Rodney Dangerfield. I saw a picture of it online and it's his like little high school photo. <laughs> and it just, it was, it was really cute. So I got in my grandmother's car and drove out to Kew Gardens. Okay, I'm walking around Kew Gardens because I want to find the Rodney Dangerfield plaque. He wasn't born here, but he spent a lot of his youth here and there's a cute little plaque for him. So let's see if we can find it. And I swear I could not find it. I was really disappointed. Um, it was supposed to be by this train station in a little park and I couldn't find it. I walked all over Kew Gardens and then I was like determined. I think it has to be here. And I eventually found it. The park, I guess, had been dissolved or <laughs> abandoned. Something happened. And that land was bought by a goddamn alehouse. Um, unfortunately, what used to be a park is now a restaurant's outdoor seating area. So I kind of snuck in. There was a nice family eating lunch. But uh, here's some cute footage of the Rodney Dangerfield sign. So awkwardly in their back patio, surrounded by tables and chairs for this bar, is a little plaque to Rodney Dangerfield. So the plaque's still there. I found it. I like interrupted this nice couple having lunch. Um, but are you kidding me? You're gonna do Rodney dirty like that? Damn it. Like, there's a million, uh, you're just asking for me to, to give you a no respect joke. It's crazy. Poor guy. I'll tell you what, me, nothing comes easy, nothing, you know? Well, last week I saw my dentist, not a beauty, my dentist. Now I said to him, can you put in a new tooth to match my other teeth? He put in a tooth with four cavities. <laughs> He performed stand-up as a teenager. Uh, he actually performed at the club where Lenny Bruce's mom was the like mistress of ceremonies, which I, oh my God, what would I pay to see a young Rodney and Lenny hanging out, being friends? What a dream. Um, but yes, of course, he went to the Catskills and he did all the clubs there. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the Catskills, it's basically dirty dancing. Like that's what it was. Um, and it was a place where all of the people from New York went to escape the heat and they went to all of these camps up in upstate. Would, don't you want like a dirty dancing, but she like, the baby like falls in love with like a young Jewish comedian and the whole movie is like montages of her learning how to tell jokes instead of dancing with Patrick Swayze. Um, am I the only one that wants that? <laughs> 
She's like learning about like Yiddish humor traditions. Yes. He basically did anything he could do to get, you know, stage time and attention and laughs. Um, he changed his name to Jack Roy, I guess, to sound more goyish. His father's last name was Roy on stage. His father went by Phil Roy. So I think it was like a sweet thing to do. It makes it so much sadder that he failed the first time around. Like he changed his name. He really was committed um, and he just wasn't very good. And it happens. It's, you know, hey, guess what? Stand up comedy is really hard. And part of the reason that I do this is because I'm consistently impressed by anyone who fails at something that's that visceral and that public and then does it again the next night. Okay, so anyway, back to our story. He's doing prop comedy. He's doing impressions of like Cary Grant and Humphrey Bogart. And you know, those were pretty common. Lenny Bruce started by doing impressions. It's nothing to look down your nose at. Impressions can be really, really good. Um, a lot of comedians start there though and then find their style later. He he definitely grew into a style that was a little more what we think of now with Lenny Bruce, a little more like hip and kind of punchline-less. Um, and in the late 40s, remember, there were like hundreds of clubs across New York and New Jersey. You could go up a ton. This is a different game. And it's such a sad picture. It really is. I don't mean to harp on it, but he changed his name and he was around all of these greats in the 40s and it must have been bad. He bombed a ton. He was pretty combative and unlikable, according to what I've read on stage. After a particularly bad set, he was like, I'm done. He stepped away. He literally sold his act to another comedian. It was just like, here's everything I've ever written. Take it, do what you want with it, you know? And so their comedian was just out telling his jokes, which is hilarious to me. Because guess what? Before... <laughs> broadcast. If someone's telling your jokes in Peoria, Illinois, it doesn't really affect your life that much. It's probably fine. Let them do it, you know? Gosh. And Rodney Dangerfield didn't perform comedy from 28 until 41. 28 to 41. Those are like your prime years as a creator and like a professional. He was like, no, I'm done. Um, he became a father during that time and he sold aluminum siding. Yep. Oh, this guy's got more bread than a prison meatloaf. He's rich, I tell you. i never seen a place with a walk-in mailbox. So, he's in his 60s. He's freshly divorced, and he's like, you know what? Let me give this another go. Let me give it another shot. So he starts performing again, and within a few years, he's performing stand-up full-time. But during that time, you know, comedy was really changing. It was becoming younger and hipper and more honest and, like, edgy, hipstery, black turtlenecks, the whole thing. And remember, he, this is early, like he came back early 60s. He didn't really pop for another, like <laughs> it wasn't immediate. He spent a lot of time toiling and working hard. A big part of it was Carson. Carson and him did not get along and getting on Johnny Carson was just so huge, right? Apparently as the story goes, Rodney heard one of his jokes on Carson and accused Carson's writer's room of stealing jokes from him. And that's sort of created this whole rift and Carson hated him for a really long time. He didn't get on Carson until 69. Um, but then, they, you know, they loved each other and he was amazing on Carson and he made Johnny laugh more than anyone. And he was on Carson over 70 times. So it worked out for him in the end. He just had to be patient. <laughs> and I don't want to drink because I'm a bad drinker, I'll tell you that, Johnny. When I drink the next day, I gotta do two things. I gotta try and locate my car, and I gotta bring back the car I took. I mean, I'm a bad <laughs> Remember that one? Yeah, sure. Of course, of course I do. Uh, of course you do. I mean, a lot of my bad. I, I don't know. Bring on the next guy. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Rodney worked so hard. So let's talk about some of the stuff that Rodney did right the second time around. Um, first of all, he really lasered in on that persona. It's so clean and it's so precise. He knows exactly who he is. He knows exactly what to write from. Um, and truly, no respect is so infamous. I can't think of another comedy catchphrase that even comes close. Like maybe it was take my wife at one point, but most people don't even know what that means anymore anyway. So... He was just, he was just tight as a damn drum. No wasted words, no complex setups. Bing, bang, boom. Hey, my wife can't do nothing right. She can't cook the worst cook in the world. 
Get my kid alphabet soup. We spelled out help. <laughs> I don't know if this is true or not, but I read somewhere that the no respect thing comes from him seeing The Godfather. Like in 72, he went to go see Francis Ford Coppola as The Godfather and he left being like, oh, that movie's all about respect and people wanting respect. And what if I played a guy who couldn't get any respect? That's an interesting... <laughs> Doesn't that seem... I don't know. I tell you guys these stories that I don't necessarily believe in because I think they're charming. Maybe I'll write a joke about a guy who can't get any respect. <laughs> this is another thing that I've heard a bunch, um, but couldn't find a single source to back it up. But I love this story and I choose to believe it, headcanon style. I've heard from comedians that he used to have all of his jokes on little 3x5 index cards and he would go up on stage when he was working out new material and he'd read through them and he'd deliver those jokes to the best of his ability and at the end they'd be in two piles yes and no and then the next night he'd come back with all of the yeses and 15 more and you just you just do it i love that i love that so much there's so much about comedy that is intangible and i love it when things are made tangible um there's so many comedians who would be a million times better if they put in 20% more effort and just wrote down their damn jokes. The other comedians that I know who all of their jokes are on napkins. It's insane. Like, I know it's not the personality type, but he did it. Like, you can see some of his notes and it's just, it's clear as day. It's really cool. I mean, and, and on no respect, yes, he has all of these amazing jokes, but he like sings in the beginning. He takes questions at the end. Like he's just so in charge and does whatever he wants. And I always love that from a comedian. And even in, in the, he like cuts the song off in the middle. And he's like, what am I doing? I don't know how to sing. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you like my Rodney impression? It's a half-ass impression. <laughs> Yes, this is my moment when face with my hand. Uh, once in a lifetime. I can't sing what the hell am I singing for, huh? There was, there was another comedian during this research phase that I couldn't stop thinking about. And no, it's not Groucho Marx, even though there is a lot to be said about Rodney and Groucho. But Steve Martin. They're two of my favorite comedians of all time. They're from one of my favorite eras in comedy history. Wow, the sun is really coming out. Power through, Katie. They're two of my favorite comedians from comedy history, and I love that time in comedy history. I love that like early 80s rambunctiousness. They're both playing sort of bad comedians on stage. Does this make sense? They're both like, wouldn't it be funny if vaudeville was still a thing? And here's a like fun interpretation of a vaudeville person. Steve Martins is definitely like one who thinks he's great and Rodney is one who's sweating and doing everything he can. I mean they're both trying too hard but for two like different motivations sort of. <laughs> Maybe that's just my style. Maybe my favorite type of comedy is like bad vaudeville. <laughs> it's like um the best possible version of hack, right? It's like Ooh, artisanal hack. Ooh, I love. Wow, am I gonna be able to keep making this video or is it too sunny? <sighs> Hold on. Okay. I had dinner last night in a Chinese restaurant. I opened my fortune cookie. And it was a guy's check next to me. <laughs> I said to him, hey buddy, I got your check. He said, thanks. So. Where were we? Rodney, he's killing it. He's doing good. He builds his own club in New York City, Dangerfields. It was a beautiful place where he brought up young comedians. Like, there are so many comedians that owe so much to him. Like, if you love Sam Kinison, if you love Louis Anderson, if you love Dice, Jim Carrey, Rob Schneider. Like, Rodney was amazing for young comedians. He was so generous with his time. Uh, so, so generous with all of his assets. And my favorite thing in the universe is watching someone have a really hard time getting famous and then just, just being so generous to the people who are now trying to do the same thing a generation later. It just, oh, it makes me so happy. It's, he was like, he had all these like little apprentices, basically. Jim Carrey has some really wonderful stories about opening with him. And no one ever even remembers Jim Carrey did stand up, but he did. And... <laughs> Everyone just knows he did sketch um, and then movies. But he did stand up and he did some weird stuff. He bombed so many times opening for Rodney and any other headliner would have been like, who's this 
goddamn kid can't tell a damn joke. And Rodney was like, well, this is interesting. <laughs> Rodney's like, you're doing your best out there, kid. They don't really get it, but uh, keep trying, you know? <laughs> Rodney just sort of let him do his thing. And he was fine with it. He, he knew that there was something there. And he, he let him find it. And that club that he built that was a, a home and a way to keep his family life afloat um just closed it was one of the first of the real new york casualties um the creek in the cave has also closed which is very sad for me as as a queen's um resident but yeah hopefully we don't see more clubs continue to close but it's gonna happen so it's very sad and the plaque is now <laughs> in a restaurant patio and his club is gone. It's more tangible steps of his memory getting just erased. And that's sad. He meant so much to so many younger comedians. Like, he would buy jokes from younger comedians that he had no intention of telling on stage. But he knew they needed the money and it was something that that he could do. He would help us out. Sometimes we would sell him jokes that he'd never used because he knew we needed the money and and it allowed us to keep our dignity, you know? Some really uh, bad material I sold them over the years. <laughs> so if you're ever in Kew Gardens, get off at the Long Island Railroad stop and go get a beer at the Ale House and toast his little plaque <laughs> in their awkward little backyard because he deserves it, man. <laughs> you know how it is. I know I'm getting old. At my age, I want two girls at once, you know. Yeah. Yeah, if I fall asleep, they got each other to talk to. <laughs> What's new with you? <laughs> I assume you're through. <laughs> <laughs> Go enjoy Rodney Dangerfield and oh my gosh, go enjoy his website because wow. He was one of the first queens to have a website in the 90s and I highly recommend using a web archive like the Wayback Machine and checking out his old website because it's very, very charming. Hi, this is Rodney Dangerfield. No one can come to the phone, so show some respect and leave a message because I don't get no respect at all. But the other day I called my wife, I told her, honey, I can't stop thinking about you. I'm getting excited. She said, who is this? Thank you. This was fun. I hope you're all well out there. If you need some distraction comedy, I don't think there's anyone I can recommend more than Dangerfield, maybe Steve Martin, the two of them. Get into it. <laughs>